And that's the news up to this hour. Compiled from major American networks, wire services, and military sources. I'm Army TFB, Bruce Dad for AFBN Radio News. AFBN, broadcasting from Saigon. <laughs> From Saigon, this is the American Forces Vietnam Network. Presenting Million Dollar Music for the Aquarian Age. The Army hangs on with an ever-changing and stressed group of soldiers. With the initial and false belief that the war will be a short one, soldiers are rotated through Vietnam on year-long tours. No, I mean, the government flew me there, but I didn't go in as a unit. And your rotation was basically the same idea. You were there for your 365 days and you were brought out as a unit and it'd be a small unit or you come out as an individual attached to a unit coming home. So, I mean, it was, it was totally different uh, for us. For officers, only six months are spent commanding a platoon. Untested soldiers are put in inconsistent units with equally untested leadership. It was a whole new experience for me. I didn't know what was going to happen. Every day was new. Uh, I knew I was going to get some physical workouts and stuff, and I was just a little skinny kid then, you know, and shy and didn't know what to expect. And uh, they kind of, uh, you know, you had your drill sergeant, you had the good drill sergeant, the bad drill sergeant. Um, both of them were with the 1st Air Cav Division, and they would tell us all kinds of stories about how the CAV operated and it was kind of scary, you know, and we figured I didn't want to wear that big yellow patch. Got sent out to my first base, got assigned to a gun, and uh, kind of like tried to fit in, but being the, what they call it, a cherry or a FNG, was you were at the, the bottom. You know, you got all the lousy details, you got the, the jokes pulled on you and stuff. And you just hoped that that first night you survived it because it was spooky. You kept seeing things moving around out there at night and you know everybody's laughing at you because there's nothing, it was a bush. The government's belief is that one year is short enough to prevent soldier burnout. This focus on the individual ignores the concerns of the unit and results in an inefficient force. Like everybody says, you get the smell, you get the heat, you don't know what it is, you don't know what to expect. You see the guys coming home, and then you see the guys going, and you know, coming in country, and you know, you get the look, you get the stare, you, you see how they react, how dirty they still looked, but they were happy to get on that plane, and that was the biggest thing. And all we kept thinking was, in 365 days, I'll be getting on that plane to go home too. Uh, I think it was an eye-opener. Um, being from New York, uh, I went to school and we were integrated with people. You didn't think anything different about them. And then when you get into the military and you meet some of the Navy personnel that's from the South and they have a different attitude towards the African-Americans, uh, it, was, it was a wake-up call. You, you really didn't believe that people were like that because I was brought up in an environment that you treated everybody the same. You were equal. And, but a lot of the uh, military personnel from the South had a different attitude about it. And I know even when we were in boot camp, you'd have your company commanders stress that everybody's equal here. He wouldn't tolerate it. Uh, if you were from the South and you didn't like someone that was an African-American doing, he, they just wouldn't tolerate it. They would put it down immediately. The military in Vietnam, much like the United States itself, is also dealing with racial strife between soldiers. A Navy base at Kamran Bay faces sailors burning crosses and raising a Confederate flag. African-American prisoners at the Long Bin Army Stockade riot over a span of weeks. There, uh, uh, I heard a few other instances of some, some troops, uh, but uh, I never observed any others. I, I went and served with a lot of other guys of color, but they all did their job. You know, after Martin Luther King got shot, the, uh, it seemed to segregate a little bit more. Uh, the black guys stayed on their side and the white guys stayed on their side. And we were kind of afraid to see what was gonna happen. We got nasty looks. The guys that came in from the States were the ones that you had to watch out for. The guys that you were with all the while, you had no problem with. You know, we had everybody's back. 
Four years earlier, in 1965, African-American soldiers represented 25% of the killed in action. Three years later, African-Americans now make up nearly 12% of both the Army and Marines. While thousands of Americans fight for their lives in the jungles of Vietnam, the government is still determined to cripple the North Vietnamese presence in neighboring Cambodia, itself a country in political upheaval. March 18, 1970. Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia is ousted by General Lon Nol, who orders the North Vietnamese out of the country while the prince is away. Sihanouk had been granting the North Vietnamese the right to set bases in his neutral country and virtual protection from the United States. The prince allies himself with the Cambodian communists called the Khmer Rouge. Two days later, Knoll's forces attack both the Khmer Rouge and North Vietnamese within Cambodia. He appeals to the United States for aid against the communist forces on April 14th. Nixon sees this as the ideal time to gain Cambodia and flush the communists from the country. If Cambodia comes in full possession of the North Vietnamese, not only will South Vietnam fall, but the U.S. forces entrenched in the country will be overtaken themselves. And at that time, I warned that if I concluded that increased enemy activity in any of these areas endangered the lives of Americans remaining in Vietnam, I would not hesitate to take strong and effective measures to deal with that situation. Despite that warning, North Vietnam has increased its military aggression in all these areas, and particularly in Cambodia. After full consultation with the National Security Council, Ambassador Bunker, General Abrams, and my other advisors, I have concluded that the actions of the enemy in the last 10 days clearly endanger the lives of Americans who are in Vietnam now and would constitute an unacceptable risk to those who will be there after withdrawal of another 150,000. To protect our men who are in Vietnam and to guarantee the continued success of our withdrawal and Vietnamization programs, I have concluded that the time has come for action. The action decided upon by President Nixon is illustrated by a large map board. Now faced with these three options, this is the decision I have made. In cooperation with the armed forces of South Vietnam, attacks are being launched this week to clean out major enemy sanctuaries on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. A major responsibility for the ground operations is being assumed by South Vietnamese forces. April 22, 1970. President Nixon begins preparing a secret invasion of the Parrot's Beak region of Cambodia, jointly with U.S. and South Vietnamese forces. Nixon believes this area northwest of Saigon still houses Viet Cong and North Vietnamese armies. Few in the government, beyond Kissinger and select others, learn of the plan until movement begins on April 28th. Not even Lon Ngo is surprised. On April 30th, South Vietnamese forces cross into Cambodia on a search and destroy mission to the fleeing North Vietnamese. They are joined the next day by American forces for Operation Rock Crusher. 36 B-52s let 774 tons of bombs loose on the fishhook's southern edge. After two hours of barraging, U.S. and South Vietnamese forces invade the Kampong Cham province. 10,000 U.S. and 5,000 South Vietnamese troops move in with armored units and mechanized infantry. So far, casualties are light. That will not always be the case as the Cambodian campaign runs through July. Back in the U.S., another battle is brewing. May 1st. 1970, Kent, Ohio. Protesters and rioters come out of local bars and start breaking shop windows downtown on this night. 
a state of emergency is called, and the police use tear gas to break up the crowd of 120. The next day, Governor Jim Rhodes calls in the National Guard to control the swell of violence. May 4th, 1970. At 11 a.m., students gather in the commons. For some, it is to protest the war in Vietnam and attacks in Cambodia. For others, even those who are apolitical, it becomes about the police state established by the rifle-wielding guardsmen. At 11.58, 96 National Guardsmen and seven police officers form a skirmish line, standing side by side. There are approximately 1,800 students in the area. Some throw objects like bricks and rocks at the National Guardsmen. At 1225, several National Guardsmen fire on the crowd. Four people are killed and nine are wounded. The country is stunned. Nixon, having jumped into the conflagration of Vietnam, struggles with the powder keg that is the next generation. It is his darkest period. May 9th, 1970. At 4.35 a.m., President Nixon, under the weight of social and media criticism, decides to take an early morning trip to the Lincoln Memorial. About 10 student protesters are staying in sleeping bags overnight at the memorial. President Nixon decides to strike up a conversation. As President Nixon tries to end the conflict in Vietnam, the country continues to grow restless with the government's handling of the war. As for the soldiers over in those humid and brutal jungles, the truth about the war's toll on them is about to come to light. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.